Hey, welcome back to the Real Estate Excellence Podcast. This is your host, Tracy Hayes. The show today is a great demonstration how powerful podcasting is. And I was just listening yesterday to another podcaster. Today, my guests like that podcaster, uh, me and I guess we haven't actually really sat down and interacted before. We've never done a deal before. I'm going to get to know our guest here uh, today through this podcast, as you will here in the next 35, 40 minutes. Uh, and so enjoy. So sit back and uh, relax. Uh, I guess here is a successful broker with eXp Realty. The Florida Coastal team is where he resides. He has a strong opinion about real estate agents and what it will take to, for them to be succeed. He's been in the business for 16 years. Just show up, says my guest today, Terry Kelly of EXP Florida Coastal team. Terry, welcome to the show. All right. Great to be here. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you came by and always honored, you know, to have you guys uh, in the in the house. Uh, we we do invite EXP to come in and, and use our facilities to, tra you know, uh, training and obviously I know with you and we'll talk a little deeper um, training is important to you yes very much so yeah and, and education so um, before we get started though we will drop a little bit for our sponsors uh, our nice furniture here in the studio from stage to sell stage to sell realty uh, is there a full service staging company as you can see they came in in our little square here and uh, decorated it very nicely Adrian and uh, Keith at stage to sell realty all right back to the show Terry tell us a little about where, where are you from where'd you grow up uh, uh, I was actually raised here in Jacksonville uh, my family relocated here uh, when I was nine mm -hmm. and uh, graduated from Terry Parker and uh, actually joined the Navy while I was still in high school. So right after high school, I left, uh, came back uh, in 1988, retired in 1991. I've done a couple things since then. But, uh, <laughs> you, well, you got married young. I was looking on your Facebook. It looked like you and your wife met while you were in the Navy, or yep. was that a high school sweetheart? Or Well, that's a, that's kind of an interesting story. I, was, uh, I got uh, to my first base, which was in Atlanta, and they found out I was a certified lifeguard, and they didn't have a lifeguard for the pool. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I got stuck being the lifeguard of the pool, which really wasn't a bad deal. And uh, <laughs> my wife came down for a uh, two-week vacation after she graduated from high school in St. Louis. Uh, we met and uh, got married in uh, that fall and been together for over 50 years now. So, Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations on that. That's really great. So, uh, Terry Parker... Go in the Navy. You say it's, this is like basically 91, you leave the Navy. Right. Mm -hmm. What it, At that time, you know, the whole world's in front of you. What were you looking to do at that time? Yeah, I didn't know. It was, it was time to grow up kind of thing. Right. Uh, I, I went back and pursued a degree, uh, got my associate's degree, and I went to UNF for quite a few years. But it, for me, it just seemed to be every time I went into the counselor, he added another 10 hours to my requirement. <laughs> so with 120-some uh, credit hours, uh, I decided to stop pursuing the uh, degree in business, but I uh, managed a uh, commercial side of a real of a uh, uh, air conditioning company for about eight years, mm -hmm. uh, decided that wasn't really what I wanted to do, and uh, got my appraiser license, realized I couldn't make the money I wanted to make to doing that, uh, went into loans. I was with Home Bank uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, they went uh, belly up, and I uh, got my real estate license then in 2005, and just I uh, finally found where I was supposed to be. That's that's really interesting. You, you kind of, you know, you tapped around a little bit. I was thinking when you were saying the HVAC. I said, well, you, so you know a little bit about that. You can, you know, I'm sure some things have changed, but you could uh, quickly uh, update yourself. Getting in, into the appraising and lending side. So you have a taste of really the whole, uh, you know, a good realm of, of our business uh, as in the real estate industry. Right, and I try to use that uh, when I'm sitting down with customers and clients that <clears throat> what's the best thing for you, you mm -hmm. know, uh, whether it be a loan program, is the house valued right? In this market, it's, it's hard to figure it, all, <laughs> right. figure it all out with how right. prices are running on us, but uh, I try to take that experience and bring it to my relationship with our customers. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. The, the appraisers right now, I mean, they're on, they're on full overload, but I know you, you know, the change at, and you may be able to educate a little bit. I know there was a change in how appraisals were o are ordered and everything after the collapse in 2008 and nine, um, 
you know, came out, how we were able to lender or lenders ordering appraisals changed completely. And that really, I heard some negative talk uh, from the appraisers, but that really kind of put a crunch in them a little bit from the profitability. That, that was actually one of the things I was, because as I was coming in, that was starting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so most of your small um, appraisal groups, mm-hmm. which might be a lot more fun to work with and all, what they were getting gobbled up by the, I don't know what they called them. Conglomerates, yeah. yeah. So I call them clearing houses. I go. don't even know what you yeah. call. Yeah, because I've yeah. had it where I've had I've had properties that we've had uh, appraisers ordered on, and it I look at the appraisal and it's way off, and I look and the guys from Daytona or you know they're but they're all tied in together, so they're using them, and they just they don't know that market. They're right. using like waterfront property in Avondale to price a house in Avondale and I'm going you know I had to call the guy and go no you, you can't do that you know mm. we had to get some changes so. yeah yeah that, I, I've heard that um, uh, complaint uh, or concern there but really it was design you know obviously the design was to get the brother-in-law out of the mm-hmm. the business for them for that lender to be able to call the same appraisal company you know and you know who knows I'm sure well we know there was scrupulous stuff going on. Not everybody, but some people yep. were doing some things to to appease their regular customer, and they, that that kind of cut that out. So, yep. um, uh, so hopefully we're better for it uh, in in the long run for it. I but, believe so. I believe I believe it did help mm-hmm. uh, cut back on some of that because the the horror stories were that you know the the agent his brother owned the property and his sister was doing the loan and, and you know, the, and you, you saw that, mm-hmm. you saw those kind of things on wine when everything collapsed. And a lot of the appraisers tell me back when it's all started to tumble back in 08 and 09, that they were getting called in by the banks and having to justify their appraisals and, uh, not a, not a position they want to be no, in. They said, mm-hmm. and that's why the, I think the smart appraisers, they go like, look, I know your, your emotions are telling you this, this is all I can support in pricing. Right, right. Um, so, you if you with the lending and then appraising, or appraising then the lending. Uh, appraisal then lending. Then you were in lending. So, you were dabbling in that. What made you make the jump over to the realtor side? Well, back then you could get if you had a pulse, you could get a loan, mm-hmm. and uh, so I would meet young couples that would come in and. I'd sit down and talk to them, and yeah, I had a loan program for them, but you could see the writing on the wall. They were they wouldn't last six months with it, probably. They were right. they were struggling now, and it wasn't like they had just graduated and their income was going to increase or something. So I would advise them to go back, work on your credit, save some money up, you know, go ahead and rent for now, but get ready to so you can make your move and get the best right. deal. And I'd send them on their way. I wouldn't I wouldn't write them a loan. And uh, one night, you I'd had a conscious. Yeah. <laughs> so one night, well, it's funny because they would sometimes leave my office and go down the hall and go into another loan officer and they would write them a loan. But, mm. uh, but anyway, um, my wife one night at dinner said, do you realize you talk more people out of getting loans than you write? And I went, yeah, that's probably a good indicator <laughs> that I'm not where I'm supposed to be. So I went ahead. I, my thought was when I got the real estate license, I could do both then, you know, right. help people find a house and write a mortgage for them. But, um, uh, that just that dropped away almost instantly. I went. That's not the path I want to be on. I just want to try to help people make the best uh, decision for themselves. Right. Uh, that meets all their needs uh, and it's uh, affordable for them. Um, your first sale. Do you remember it? Nope. You don't remember your first sale. Mm, well, yeah, I do. Now that you mentioned it, <laughs> it's, it's jogged to memory. Yeah. Uh, there. How did it come? It was just a friend or, I mean. Yeah, it was a friend. He was trying to buy a house, uh, and uh, I actually put him in an option loan, if you remember what those were. Oh, yeah. There were four options. You could pay the note, or you could pay part of the note, or you could go upside down on the note. I mean, right. it, was, it, yeah. was, uh, it was great for investors that had money, and I looked at it more as a short-term thing. But uh, I put him in that loan, and um, I sat down at the closing table and heard the attorney explaining all the options that were in it, and I'm going like, I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, mm. so it caused me to go back and I went to, I got some schools and when I first started in 2005, the option arm was getting pushed out where I was at. They, they stopped, had just stopped doing it. And then, but then all of a sudden, not, not, I don't know, a year later, 
they devised a very similar type product that came out. And for those who don't understand the option arm, you had an option to pay less than interest. Yeah. You know, uh, so you had interest being piled on the back of your loan. So uh, much like a, a reverse mortgage um, where the balance is going up because they were all speculating on the house value going up. Uh, I always remember it in, in the, it's 2005, 2006, and I remember, you know, looking at the prices in, of some of these homes, and I'm like, there's not enough Americans that make some, I mean, the price point of some of these, I'm like, there's just not a, there's not enough jobs that are paying that to afford that, um, but there there is loan products out there, guys and girls, that will lend you money, they don't know what you spend on Friday night. They see on that credit report, you know, your car payment, some credit cards, but they don't know you like to go out and spend and go to Disney World and pay cash or whatever. And when it comes down to it, when your house payment's more than uh, what's left in your budget, you're, you're, you know, in danger zone. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you had, you had a conscious on that. And I, I um, it was, it was, it was hard for you. I, I, I. I, I can understand exactly where you're at, where you're at. Um, there's, uh, there's even people today, I, unfortunately, with the pricing going up here in this area so much, and I see them come in, and then they're, they, they want to, I call it beat the Joneses, they, wanna, they want the best school, everyone does, but unfortunately, those properties are going to pay more, and they're, they're putting themselves in really in a bad situation yeah. Uh, in the long run, but again, a lot of times some people are making money on the side. We don't know. We like to tell our each other, tell ourselves that to make ourselves feel good. Maybe there's another income that you know. Uh, who knows? Yeah, they're babysitting a lot on the side. I don't know. That's actually one of my passions is trying to avoid that with people. Mm-hmm. And then right now, as I'm sure you know, the last numbers I saw was like 1.9 million uh, mortgages in serious default now in the United States. So it's. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff going to happen, and when we went through the last time back, I came in in '05, so I rode through the the ramp up to the to the crash, and uh, we had people. I I ended up I ended up forming my own brokerage that dealt with foreclosed properties in 2010. Mm-hmm. And as I'd meet these people, uh, you know, you, I, I got to admit, my initial perception was like, you know, these guys, you know, they didn't make their payments and they're losing their house. But as I met them, they were they were living the dream. This is this is where they're going to raise their kids and family and all mm-hmm. that. And they were crushed because there was an adjustment. Prices fell. They couldn't afford it anymore. The arms were hitting. So what what I realized during that early on in that process was this is this could be me. Mm-hmm. This could be these this these aren't bad people. There's just something happened and turned. And and if they had known a little bit more early on, they could have avoided it. I, I think education is where you're yeah. leading to there. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. Uh, when I started, um, you know, the, these people doing cash out to yeah. 100% of the value of their home, um, you know, the stated income type stuff. And But what I saw was they were buying that, that, that house, which – was reasonably priced in those pr- uh, values are probably through the, I can't imagine where the houses are. I know the house there, they were buying in, in, I go to an area of, uh, in Maryland outside of DC. So they had government jobs. They, the milk was there. So they were, they had this government job forever. And the man that what they were doing is they would take 50 grand out of their house. And really what it was is to pay off, pay it down, pay off credit cards because they all were driving the Escalades yep. and have the six, seven, eight hundred dollar payments on their cars, and they didn't. They didn't realize they were. You know, yes, someone will lend you that money. They'll risk that money to put it on the street. That's it's a game. But the only person that can handle your own budget is you. Yeah, you're yeah. responsible for it. And I, I think a lot of uh, people move in these neighborhoods. I you know like to live. I, say I live in a nice neighborhood. I see some of them people move in neighborhoods like that, and I'm like. You know what? You're gonna look at the cars next to the driveway next to you, and the cars over here. What the kids are doing, and got to have the big birthday party for the kids because that's what the neighbors doing. And all of a sudden, the budget's out of whack. Exactly. exactly. And and you got to run with that. And that's that's something that unfortunately no lender and no credit card company or, or car dealer is going to evaluate for you other than yep. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so you you, uh, you were Century Twenty One. 
and then jumped over to EXP in, in 2018, if I saw your bio Correct. correctly. Mm -hmm. What was the um, desire to, you know, reasons to, for that jump? Because you were a broker at, at Century 21 as well, right? Right. I yeah. own the franchise. Mm -hmm. To back up to, I started out with Remax. Remax was a great experience for me. Mm -hmm. That's when we went through the tumble. Uh, I focused on short sales back then. That's part of one of my passion is now that I, I saw that as well as then the aftermath with the uh, actual foreclosures. But I was with Remax for a while. Uh, I kind of broke away from a team, went on my own. Uh, my business partner now, Chris Snow, was at Remax. He came over also said he wanted to join up, and so he and I took off. So you and Chris have been together for a while because yeah, he's with you yep, at EXP? Okay. Correct. Yeah, well, we were actually in Lindy together all the way back. So oh, okay. We went to church together. We were in a Bible study together, and, you know, he's a lot younger than me. Okay. He's the same age as my kids. But mm. uh, anyway, uh, so he, uh, he came over and joined me. We decided we saw the foreclosures coming, so we opened up uh, our own independent brokerage, Southern REO, uh, did, uh, and just did – foreclosed properties for five years at the end of that run then uh, we can come back to it coaching mm -hmm. I, I got a business coach about two-thirds of the way through my time with uh, Southern REO right and uh, they opened my eyes to actually running a business not you know dealing with emotion or ego I was real proud that I owned my own brokerage we were I was doing about 50 deals a year you mm -hmm. know and it was uh, life was I thought really good uh, but when I broke it down with the business coach, uh, at the very end of that, I was only making around four hundred, four hundred fifty dollars a deal. Didn't make sense at that point. Right. So, so I opened up another brokerage then that did strictly uh, res or traditional uh, home sales. Right. And so at that point, Century Twenty One approached us and offered us to purchase a franchise. It's interesting what you just said because I. Um uh, show we had a couple days ago, Angie Bell, she is a former realtor and a successful one. She is full-time coaching. Mm -hmm. um, and she talked about uh, when she was in the corporate, before becoming in the real estate, she got a corporate, she was in the corporate world, got a coach then. So the first thing she did when she got into real estate was get a coach. Yeah. How important do you think that is? And uh, if you kind of explain, because I know you like to educate, educating your, your um, realtor, um, Further, fellow EXP agents on how important, what, what, what level should someone reach out to get a coach and how important is that coach? Well, uh, what can it really do for your business? The first step is I think most agents don't look at their business as a business. They're, they're working for a brokerage, but in actuality, it's, you know, they're a business you. owner. And uh, if you don't look at your business that way, you'll never see the subtle changes that are coming in and you find out like I did. I'm, I thought I was living the dream mm -hmm. <laughs> back with I was doing, you know, who would want to do around 50, 60 deals a year. Right. Uh, but if you're only making, you know, 30, 40,000 off that, the seven days a week, 10 hours a day, they yeah, don't, it doesn't not, have yeah, that. Yeah. So. But anyway, uh, like I say, I went, it was, uh, I got uh, REB school was the uh, 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 program I went to. They did a, they did a real good job of breaking everything down for me. And they actually, they said, we don't want to help you sell houses. We want you to form your business. This is, these are the struct, this is the structure you need to put in place to be successful. And, you know, it was, you know, you looked at your finances, you looked at your marketing, you determined what your rate of return was on the investment. You know, you just, it, he gave us all that. And that's right. what, that's what opened my eyes. That, it was actually, I was at one of the seminars. One of the financial guys was, we were just sitting in a hall talking he says, tell me about your business. And I told him, and he stopped for a minute, and he goes, Terry, I, I got a question. Why are you even in the business? And I, I'm thinking, you know, what's this guy? <laughs> and he says, uh, he goes, you, you know, by the numbers you just gave me, you're, only, you're making less than $500 a deal. And I, I said, no, I'm making over three grand a deal, you know. Mm -hmm. Then when I did the math, he was right. So uh, that that's what really solidified that it was a decision I wanted to grow, so I went to a coach. And it was early on he opened my eyes that I really needed to change. Because you can get caught up in all the, hey, I, I'm doing 50, 60 deals, man. That's more than a lot of other people. But they're not realizing with all the other commotion you're making, what are you actually making uh, even broken down to the hour? Yeah. And um, it was I was listening to another great podcast. Actually, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, an EXP agent that has a podcast out of Salt Lake City. Um, uh can't, the name's right there. It'll come to me in a second. Um, but he was breaking it down, 
from this from that same point point, he has the same attitude you do uh, about making it a business but when you break it down by the hour and it's like some of this little administrative stuff you got to hire that stuff out yeah the stuff that's you you can pay someone 12 15 dollars an hour because you got to be that three four five hundred dollar an hour person yep. you got to handle those things and make the five hundred dollars an hour not sitting there at home twiddling with twelve fifteen dollars an hour that someone can do that doesn't have your experience your vision and what you're trying to do yeah and there's a lot of you know there's a push now to go to the virtual assistants and you can a lot of the you know repetitive stuff that just needs to be done you can mm. farm out for you know you can get some college graduate uh level people out there that'll work for you know eight dollars an hour and you can you can push all that aside where typically I'm sitting down doing the research mm-hmm. and generating the, the publicity or whatever and then putting it out there. So, no, that's a good point. And that's one of the things that the coaches pointed out too was um, how much are you making an hour? And they broke – when yeah. they broke that down, you know, well, you're, you're, what you want to make is 250 an hour and you're making around 18 an hour. Or so, you know, so you yeah. stop doing that, focus on where you're good at – where you can generate the 250, 300, 400,000, 400. I sense you, you enjoy, uh, obviously you became a broker. You, you know, you're, you know, leading up the Florida coastal team. Uh, you like giving back to the other agents, help, you know, giving your guidance, your experience from that standpoint. When you were having this discussion, did you think, you know, maybe I should just be my solo agent and do my hopefully two, three, four deals a month and, and not get involved with all this other stuff? Well, you know, when you're once I made the change to be a broker and, and own a brokerage, that all kind of changes because the responsibility is there. And that's I, I talk to people and they'll say like, "I'm going to get my broker's license. I'm going to open my own office." And I go, "It was a great experience, but it's probably the worst thing I ever did." Mm-hmm. But once you get into that, it's it, it's hard for me to conceptualize being out there on my own. Now, I don't I don't do production. I you know if I have friends and family or somebody you know comes right. up says, please, you know, sell me a house. Mm. I'll work with them. But pretty much anybody that comes to me, I pass on to a team member uh, and let them handle it. Uh, I'm, I'm 70 years old now, so I'm not out there. You know, I'm not – I've already done the things I want to do. I don't have that big why that a lot of people do. Right. But what I do have uh, is that I want to give back. We, we talked a little bit about training. We're, we do a monthly training. You've been kind enough mm. to let us use the conference room here, and it's been awesome. But – like we did social media last month. This t- actually this afternoon after this, we're doing a, a, a class on lead conversion, and this is open to everybody in the area. We publish it on Eventbrite, and anybody's welcome to come to it. It is not a EXP recruiting event, but it is happens to be Chris Snow and I that are putting it on. Mm-hmm. So we we both feel strongly that we want to raise the level of uh, of the agent that it's working in our market area. Because it's when you sit and you talk to some of them, you're going like they, they are struggling. They need I'm somebody totally, to come along. I'm totally, and it's at, you know we were talking earlier, and I was telling you how I, you know how I evolved the podcast. But um, you know I'm I'm involved. I do a lot with the St. Augustine um, uh, board. Uh, education because I, I do have the, the CDD class which is not offered. No one has. I, I eventually want to have time to develop it into a CE class, but making the the agents uh, better. Um, you know, I, I deal with it on a daily basis from a lending side where I've got one right now where I, I think this realtor really after the deal's done. I, I mean, I'm probably not in the position to, but I'd really like to sit them down and say, hey. Let me, let me explain to you what you just caused and this angst that you yeah. created yeah. with between me, my manager, the, uh, the builder, and your client. And you, uh, you had made this a miserable experience for them. Because when it's all said and done, when that person opens that door with their key, they sign the paperwork, they now walk in, they don't real. they're not – they're not going to dwell on, oh, my God, I just signed the paperwork for a payment I can't afford. They're going to think about how they felt through this right. whole transaction. And that's what I think a lot of people miss is, um, you know, it's, it's like you hear things, it's not what you say, it's how you made them feel. Exactly. It, yeah. It's the same thing. And this is, how do you feel when it's all over? 
was it was you know may, there there are always issues and no matter what we do every you know, not every transaction but a lot no matter what we do there's bumps in the road in how the people handle it and get us back on and, and accomplish the goal um, that's why we have jobs right, right, <laughs> right. that's why we have things to do because there's problems and we solve them and this particular agent because they are not educated in the ways of uh, how things are done, how to read the loan estimate. They're trying to ed- tr- they're trying to educate a um, a uh, buyer uh, with a little bit of knowledge, which makes them dangerous. Yeah, you know, and and it's really making a miserable experience. And I sensed it from the my manager sensed it when she talked to the buyers. I talked to buy you know uh, buyers and the site agent all feel the same way that. This agent's the one who keeps trying to make, yeah. you know, ruffle the feathers. It's like, dude, sometimes you just need to back off. We see that, you know, far too often. That's mm-hmm. that's kind of what's got Chris and I going on the, uh, let's, let's put some stuff out there to try to help. But when you, to your point, you get, you get in situations. I'm dealing with, uh, there's a local agent that I know that he called and he says, I need, I need your bump something off you. And he's involved in a deal that it's just like I would lose sleep over. He mm. is losing sleep over <laughs> because, and it really, it's the uh, agent on the other side has really, uh, he's, you know, he's, uh, he's almost like he's playing an attorney, you know, like, right. oh, we don't have to do that. No, ruin. he's been very uh, argumentative all the way through it. And now nobody is happy. I, I can't imagine that that agent's, uh, clients are happy now either. It's got to be just right. a nightmare across the board. So we try to we try to avoid that. And, we, and with the agents that we work, we've got, I think, 22 agents on our team now. And that's something we really stress mm-hmm. is that, you know, what, what, tell me what's going on. How can we fix this? I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear that, you know, he really upset me in the meeting. I don't care about your feelings. I'm talking to my agents now. Uh, I don't really care what your feelings are now. Mm. What do we need to do? What right. do we need to do to make it right? And like the one agent that I'm talking to, there's going to be some extra costs go to his uh, his buyers, and he's he, he's stepping up. He's going that you know I, we're right in the give middle us, of all give this, it so he's paying for you know some of the things to make it all happen, which I think is the right thing. Do you do. feel some? agents um get a little overzealous from the standpoint that they want to show their value by fighting something that i mean that's sometimes it's they're fighting against a brick wall it's like but you keep fighting it and like dude you're everyone else realizes that's a brick wall you just give it up but they keep fighting it though i don't know if they feel there's need to it's an ego thing or they need to show value to their client i I can't yeah and i've run into it and i've run in i've had situations where you go well these people are being jerks i mean this is you know you got to be kidding me and uh, you meet them later on and they weren't even aware it was going on and we've we've even had i can't because the agent almost got involved like they were the buyer that's exactly right so (laughs) now you're now you're uh, you're 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 dealing on pure emotion and ego yeah point yeah and what i always one of the things i like to say is that we're the professionals here. We're the ones that need to focus on getting this deal done. To the other agent, when they start, when you can feel it starting to build, that you know they're pumping their chest out. You know, like I've got the right, and I go, you know, you can be. What was it the uh, professor told me? You can be, you can abide by all the laws of the land and be the most unethical person out there. Mm-hmm. And that's what we try to bring. That's that's our job as realtors to keep everything together. Uh, we actually, we, you know, we want to represent our client. We don't want to, you know, give away stuff to make everybody happy. But by the same token, you know, letting emotion creep into it doesn't help any yeah, of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had a statement like, uh, on one of your social media, empowering real estate professionals to succeed. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, there's a lot of a lot of agents are limited by where they're at. Um, and that they, that. They, uh, physically or physically, okay. and, I, I, and I'm, you know, I, if you get to know me, I don't badmouth brokerages. It's just different, you know. Mm-hmm. But they're in a place where they're not gonna, they're not gonna succeed. They're not being advised to get coaching. If they're getting coaching, that's being sold to them by, you know, somebody. Where I, like at EXP, uh, you mentioned earlier, Grant Cardone. Mm-hmm. Grant Cardone is doing free coaching in EXP now, mm-hmm. and it's, I mean, it's open for everybody. Uh, I do. I do coaching with EXP. It's free. I do. I actually focus on return on investment. I have a spreadsheet I create, and once a month I do a class. 
about 50 agents from around the country attend, and uh, I, I hand out this spreadsheet to help them track their business. That's what I want to do is try to add value back to the agent so they can make wise decisions for their business. And if they don't know about if, and it's amazing to me, I'll have 50 agents sitting in a classroom, and I'll say, how many of y'all are tracking your business? And nobody raises their hands. And, you know, that, that, brings up an, that brings up an interesting thing because and you say that, and I've, I've had – you know, some very high level, um, uh, I'll say, you know, a couple of Keller Williams brokers on here, they're very successful. And they talked about when they started their careers, didn't know anything, they relied on the system. They relied mm -hmm. on what others, experts came down and said, these are the best practices. But how many agents do we see just, they get that license and they just either don't know what to do next they're bashful, shy. They don't know, you know, let me go find out the smartest guy in the room and, and sit down with them and find out how I need, should you know, what I should do tomorrow morning when I wake up. What is the disconnect there for you think a lot? Well, a lot of it people get into the business because you, you, your own hours, you make all kinds of money and mm -hmm. you travel a lot, right? And, you know, and you drive really nice cars. Uh, the reality is uh, not so much. You know, you're going to put, you're going to have to put your time into it. And we, mm -hmm. we try to, uh, like when I, I'll talk to a new agent coming in, I'll sit down and help them develop their sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. That's free leads out there sitting that you can tap into. You may not close a deal with them right away, but you start building that relationship. And like you talked about with the podcast, there are, you'll have friends and family that'll see the podcast and go like, "Oh, that's right, Ethan Lending." You know exactly. And, and so exactly. Uh, we try to we try to develop that relationship. That's free and easy. Uh, and then I have a little program of how you contact them, how often you do what you say. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we start building on, uh, and again, like at EXP, our platform, I can, I can run a, a Facebook post on any EXP listing in the area. Um, so I can actually post up, did you see this house in St. John's County or whatever. Right. Uh, so again, that's free for them. So we try to develop that with them so that now their business is growing. We give them the tools, like the training that we're going to give this afternoon is the same training we give to every one of our agents. This is how you do business. A book uh, that we like to hand out is Fanatical Prospecting. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if it really, it weeds it out. We've had agents leave that, that once we got into it, they go like, oh, this is too hard. And it is hard. It's, you work at it, but the rewards are great. You can make you know, more money in this business uh, than most anywhere you can go. I right. mean, now, you told me um, earlier, EXP, was originally created about 2009, 2009 yeah. but but recently it's exploding. And I was looking at some of your um, your social media. You were giving some, talking about some statistics about uh, the amount of brokerages now and how many are in line, you know, to come over to EXP. What is EXP doing now? Where some maybe some of these experienced agents and you know been somewhere for five, ten years. Hey, I mean, we you know see what's EXP doing. What what is EXP doing? Well, we, we, we say that we're the disruptive technology in the marketplace now. Mm -hmm. We're a virtual office, which a lot of people go, I got to have, I, need, I really need a place to you know, physically sit. The reality is nobody goes into the office anymore. No. You don't get any business walking through the door. Uh, I mean, some, you know, some of the, like Watson has, what, a thousand offices in the area. They, right. They'll pick some up, you know, uh, but the odds of you as an agent getting those are, are slim. Um, I lost my thought. Where, where were we at? <laughs> What's EXP doing? Well, so, yeah. so EXP, we have uh, we 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 offer all kinds of training. We have seventy hours of training a week. It's live training. Mm. Uh, we have heavy hitters like Grant Cardone come in and do it. Three of my past business coaches are now coaching at EXP. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a basic you know model business model but we we like to point out that the agent is actually an owner the stock owner in the business so you're making all the experts that we you know we're talking about you know your your new realtor you just got your license okay where should i go and i think anyone who's been listening to my podcast so far uh the agents have all told you you need to interview 
you know, the broker yeah. that you're doing? Is this someone that is going to mentor you? Because that's really what you're looking for. And, and then do you have access to the education that you need? And, and obviously, you know, obviously no one's sitting there for 70 hours a day. But, you know, you should be, I'm sure you guys probably talk about, it, you should be spending X amount of hours yeah. a week sharpening your sword. Exactly, yeah. We, we teach that you should be making calls uh, about three hours a day. We mm -hmm. recommend between 8 and 11. That's one of the higher contact rate times of the, of the day. And if you can't do that, between 5 and 8. Uh, but but that's, a, that's a mandatory part of what you do as a realtor. You should be prospecting that. And then you need to know what you do when you get them on the phone. And there mm -hmm. goes, that goes into the training. But we offer, uh, the like the 70 hours of training, every Sunday night you get an email and say, here's all the training next week. What I tell the agents, go through and look at it and go like, oh, I want to know more about you know, return on investment. I want to know more about the platform we're using or whatever. Highlight those, and then you jump into the training. Uh, we use avatars. It's a live, like if we were in the world doing this, mm -hmm. which we could be, we would each have an avatar here sitting talking. But anybody that's watching it can hit their mic and say, hey, Terry, I don't understand what you meant about that, and we deal with it. And so mm -hmm. my class that I teach is very interactive. The, the agents are always asking, why do you put that there, or why? How, how do you get that number? So it gives me time to go back and explain it. So the training is at a level that I, I've never seen. I mean, I was a owner of a Century, Century 21 brokerage, and they have a lot of training, but it's, it's taught by – professional trainers reading from a script that's been generated by somebody that's been in the business at some time in the past, but they're not out there producing. Mm -hmm. Where our instructors typically are uh, someone like me. I've been in the business. I've got some experience, and I'm willing to share it. And when somebody says, let me help you get more listings, you, you sit in their class, and they actually download their scripts and their the whole plan. Yes, and it's, the yes, sharing yeah. is, is over the top. Yeah. Then so, beyond that, though, it, the, the, the real attraction, what caused me to move over is I looked at, at Century 21, my business plan was run the brokerage for 10 years and then try to sell it. And uh, with EXP, I, I, I am building an escape plan as I go along mm -hmm. through the stock program and through the revenue share program. I, I've, I've, I've heard about it. Unfortunately, we don't have time to talk right, about right. all of that part, but it's definitely someone uh, as an agent out there and you're looking for a possible new brokerage, uh, EXP. Obviously, I'm sure uh, we'll get Terry's contact information, which will be in the show notes and so forth. And and I know Daniel's put it up on the screen for those watching Facebook Live. I'm sure Terry would gladly sit down with you and and go over the you know the pros and cons of EXP and what you you know set proper expectations. 